Hey everyone, I uh, have the huge privilege of uh, sitting today with uh, Niket Desai, who uh, we have uh, in South Africa for a couple of days only, so we managed to nab him and, um, and get him on our stage at Heavy Chef uh, for a, an event and a masterclass. And today I'm going to ask him a few questions just before the event. Uh, we're going to ask him about uh, his experience at his first company, Punched, and then uh, the subsequent sale to Google, his time at Google, as well as his experience at Flipkart, which is uh, widely known as one of the fastest growing companies in the world, uh, and uh, just before they sold to Walmart, and then try and glean some of the lessons that, uh, that we can interpret for our own context in South Africa. Niket, welcome to South Africa, welcome to Africa, and uh, it's a real honor to have you here. I just want to jump straight into it and ask you just a little bit about, I, I mean, I read up about your backstory and, um, and, uh, and the way you started as an entrepreneur, but I thought maybe you can tell us the, the, the personal first-hand story of, uh, of you as a 20-year-old hustling away in the streets of Silicon Valley trying to set up your first business. Yeah, definitely. Well, it's, first of all, it's amazing to be here. Um, you know, when I was in university, actually the iPhone had just come out uh, midway through. And at the time, I don't think people fully understood what the impact of having a computer on every person on the planet would be. And, you know, neither did we, but it was a very compelling and interesting thing. And we understood at the time as students that different parts of our lives would change in terms of having a phone. Communications was a simple one and video and things like that. But uh, I was particularly interested in commerce. Um, I thought that going to different places and paying with your phone and having it track all your purchases would be kind of a neat thing. When I met my co-founders, uh, Reed had actually prototyped an application that kind of handled all of your marketing and all of your buy ten get one free cards, and I thought okay. that was, and I thought that was very amazing. What year was this run about? It was uh, in two thousand ten. Okay. And at the time, I still remember a lot of the information. Um, iPhone penetration in the United States was very small. In fact, smartphones were sub twenty five percent. Okay. Wow. Uh, that said, within universities, it was closer to 60%, 60-70%. And so what happened was, in many ways, people who were attending college at that time were living in what we now classify as normal. Sure. And so a lot of our work in the early days of building a company where you could go and buy things and track that with your phone and then be able to communicate with stores, we were, in many ways, living that life in school, but we had to convince venture capitalists and other people that actually iPhones and smartphones were going to be a big thing. Sure. Uh, before you could you even get there. I was 20. 20. I was 20 or 20 21. Yeah, oh, exactly. Okay. So the time that I think I was chasing girls and and, and beer and and pretty much doing everything other than setting up a, a multi-million dollar company. So so how did it? What did it look like in those early days? And 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 that, that rapid growth that you experienced? Yeah, well, you know, it was slower than people think. Okay. Um, and, and, and the reason for that is because nowadays there's so much, res it's actually much better to be an entrepreneur today. It's tougher to build a business, but much better to be an entrepreneur because there's so many resources. Sure. You know, half the stuff we were building in Cake PHP, which is a very old type of architecture, yeah. you know, your buildings for the first time has a lot of bugs. There's not much resources out there to go solve for it. When you're building things on the iPhone, especially scanners and things like that, yeah. there's no real testing. There, you don't have the scale of it. You know, people forget that the iPhone came out in 2007, but the App Store didn't come out till 2008. Yeah, and so, sure. while there was a lot of apps that were coming out, even the sophistication of those apps was quite less. Yeah. You know, now when we think about the the different types of software that have been built, it's just orders of magnitude more complicated and, and sophisticated. Sure. So you guys hand coded this. Punched with PHP, and you, you, I mean, you basically figured out how to put it onto the App Store, and and 
Yeah, you know, Reed, Xander, and I, including our team, you know, what's amazing is that even today, actually, I think we hold a series of patents and provisional patents on okay. what will, if, if you look back in time, will look quite simple. Um, but yeah, a lot of the things we were working on probably were first in, first in kind, I should say, okay. for that platform. It's not that it hasn't been done before, sure. just not really on phones. And so what got you to the point of, uh, of the interaction with Google and obviously the subsequent uh, sale to Google? We were fundraising. So once we realized that people, and especially businesses actually, were signing up for our service hoping to connect to customers and doing so reliably, it became clear we could build a business out of this. At first it was, uh, frankly, it was a school project. Okay. and. Um, but a school project that got sell, sold to Google. Yeah, That's actually, even more interestingly, the project at Cal Poly, which is where Reed and Xander went to school, th it was actually, I think, in part funded by Google that it was an Android class where I think phones had been provided oh, wow. for them to learn how to code on the Android operating system. And that's the first prototype was actually built on Android. And so it was somewhat ironic, but also amazing that the company that would acquire our company ended up being the ones that kind of started it. We were fundraising and so we had met with tons of venture capitalists, tons of amazing angels and people that were trying to help us and one of the groups was Google and we had gone under the guise that we were looking for investment. Sure. And it kind of makes sense because back in 2011, Google's mappings products were becoming much more widely used. Um, beyond just telling you directions, I think they had aspirations to tell you about everything. Uh, places to eat, what was going on there, yeah. times that it was open. And we were one of many technologies that they were looking to incorporate to provide that to their customers, so the okay. people that use Google Maps and other services like that on a daily basis. Okay. And what we were providing was access to these small businesses which were notoriously difficult to onboard to digital systems. Sure. And I think they saw us as an opportunity to go and connect to small businesses. Yeah get them onto the broader Google platform at, at scale and at speed. And it became clear that instead of perhaps investing in us, that actually acquiring us as part of a set of acquisitions that they had made that year okay. to go and attack that commerce okay. space. Okay, so they wanted the team, they wanted the technology, they wanted you guys and the, the IP that you had built up in order to plug it into their own systems. Yeah, into what is a formidable product. I mean, Google Maps, people don't really appreciate, you know, uh, I think if you think about search engines, behind Google and YouTube, Google Maps is probably one of the largest ones out there in the entire world. Sure. So then you, you worked in Google, right? And what was that experience like? Google is a tremendous company uh, sure, yeah. in a number of ways because beyond the sheer technical depth that they have, the company itself is run in ways that I think at the time were way ahead of most companies. And now even today, as Google and ex-Googlers are called Zooglers, go to other companies, try to take those ideas and culture with them. And they always had a very, what I would call, kind of pragmatic approach to running the company, yeah. which was whatever made the most sense, just do that. Okay. And I know that seems obvious, but I think a lot of companies and a lot of teams ultimately somehow find ways to not do the obvious thing. Yeah. But they really studied what it was that top tier teams kind of had in terms of culture and process and, and style. And they found ways to incorporate or disseminate that across the broader organization as much so, as possible. So the secret source, if I'm hearing you right, is that they're really good at building up these amazing teams that can produce the great products that they're famous for. The, they're producing. clearly amazing at finding excellent talent first okay. uh, and, and attracting and retaining that sure. uh, talent. And, and I think they do that because their problems are interesting. Okay. But on top of that, they create an environment where you can also create the environment that works for you. Sure. And that continues to just get more and more people for sure. When we enjoined, you know, the resumes of the people that sat to, to, to the left and right of me were 10 times my resume. Yeah. No, maybe 100 actually. You're a school kid. And well, <laughs> that and just, you know, even then I always felt um, such deep passion and commitment from the folks that work there. For sure. So, okay, so you, you basically were exposed to this wonderful environment and, uh, and where it was. 
I mean, how, how much did it grow during that period? How much did Google grow during that period to when you left? We were in the tens of thousands that went into the hundreds of thousands. So we're yeah. talking about an entire magnitude. Wow. They, uh, and, and, and done so in a way that you wouldn't even notice okay. as an employee uh, because just again, you know, when you think about growing a company from 10 to 100,000, normally these, you know, challenges are not, there's not many people out there that experience that sure. or have that experience even to do so, do that. Sure. And so the way that they're able to do that while minimally di disrupting your ability to work and contribute, yeah. uh, you know, it's just. And I mean, I think just taking that, so you, you were working in product and you saw that you were exposed to this rapidly scaling team that was I mean, obviously one of the fastest growing companies uh, you know we've ever seen you you then transplanted that knowledge and and expertise and product over to Flipkart in India right so I mean how, first of all how did that happen and secondly how did that feel being in such a different environment from uh, Silicon Valley to to India yeah, it, they're completely different. Um, the way we re that I reached Flipkart was actually Google had acquired Motorola, and okay. a small contingent of Googlers went over to Motorola to help kind of integrate the company and also build the next version of it. And so my boss, Puneet Sony, who was a vice president there at Motorola, um, he was a Googler as well, we were working on phones together, building watches, software, and services like this. And the phones that we were building, our aspirations was to build a Android device that would really enable the next billion people. Mm. And of course, in India, tremendous amount of people just getting online. And we were hoping to create phones that had the best of Google's capabilities with Motorola's wonderful qualities in, in devices and make that available in India. And a small company at the time, an e-tailer called Flipkart, we had partnered with them to sell phones and they really pioneered a lot of online purchasing in India. Yeah. Uh, it's not that it wasn't there, it's that they took a model that we obviously had in the United States with Amazon and made it more palatable for the Indian, for the Indian market. market for sure. right? And one of the key parts of their business was selling phones. That was kind of a huge business and mm -hmm. Motorola's devices ended up being quite popular along with a couple of Chinese manufacturers and Flipkart really drove a lot of those uh, that sales there. Okay. That connectivity with uh, Puneeth then you know he became the chief product officer of the company and I went along as his chief of staff to run the product organization. Okay so you were essentially looking at product but building the teams in order to to build that product right? I think that's kind of one of the amazing parts about being a chief of staff so if you think about just any company, what, what is an enterprise? It's, it's just a group of people, sure. right? So when you're working on the enterprise, you're building, you're abstracting the product by one layer. So you're building the product that builds the product, AKA the organization and the team. Yeah. So a lot of my work at Flipkart was more geared towards how should we think about this organization and how it should be structured? What ownership should be sent where? How should we be thinking about growth? And what kind of processes and, and strategic decisions should we be making for you know, the 10, 20 year frame, but also the one and three year frames sure. that you know, just to make sure we execute in the short term. For sure, so, so this was now at a really intense time for Flipkart, right? Because that's one of the fastest companies, fastest growing companies in one of the fastest growing markets in the world, right? It so. was a tremendous amount of pressure. At the time, we had just become also one of the most valuable private companies in the world. Sure. Amazon was, had come to India in a much more forceful way. I think that anyone that knows Amazon as a business and the folks that work there, they are tremendous talents as well. So mm -hmm. not only do you have a very complex Indian market, which is built up by a wide variety of socioeconomic variants, but then also from the perspective of just different cultures. India is not only one nation, but it is composited of many states. And sure. these states and the people within them in terms of languages, cultures, and customs, radically different. And so that meant that personalization, as well as the challenge of data quality and just general infrastructure or lack thereof, mm. were things that we'd have to work on. You know, in India, um, cash on delivery, which was, again, something that Flipkart worked hard to integrate and, and, and add to the e-commerce 
supply chain allowed them to take money when they delivered goods, okay. which was unusual. And that's because a small percentage of Indians had digital means to pay for things. For sure. So they had to pioneer in order to meet that. that that's sort, right. To, to solve that challenge, I guess. To simply unlock the customers that they wanted or had, they had to build entire infrastructures. It sounds, I mean, Niket, it sounds remarkably <laughs> familiar to us here in, in Africa. I mean, the, uh, many of the challenges that you're outlining that you faced at Flipkart feel very similar to the, the, the challenges that enterprises in Africa have to face when trying to grow within the African context. So, I mean, just in closing with this interview, if you could potentially transplant some of those lessons and share with us some of the, the lessons that you learned and resolved uh, whilst, you know, at Flipkart, and, and hopefully we can then glean uh, some of those learnings for ourselves. Definitely. So, I think that First of all, coming from the U.S., where it's an entrepreneur's dream, you sure. have you have you know a fairly rich populace. You have strong infrastructure, digital connectivity, uh, kind of a homogenous English-speaking sure. uh, consumer set. The same, right, it it, al the same language. it allows you to really reach a broad audience that can pay for things sure. quickly. And and when you're in a place like India, it's not that you can't reach people. It's that their ability to pay for things, the trust that they have in your system, things they've never seen before. Sure. You have to build all of that. And I think that was a tremendous challenge, especially coming from the U.S. where we took those things for granted. And now, you know, my time in India really humbled, uh, uh, at least me. But I, looking back, I do believe that was the answer. I think that it is also the strength uh, in, in, in building a product organization and a product, which is that if you're able to build something that truly meets those constraints, you'll be very difficult to compete against. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that means not only building a product that works for your consumers in each of the ways that they need help, either through personalization or mm -hmm. you know, infrastructure type stuff, but it also means that building a team that's equally diverse and understands those challenges and therefore is most equipped and ready to see them and solve for them, okay. which is such a critical part of building a long and durable company. Sure. And in the short term, it feels better to just grab a bunch of people that look like you for speed and that makes a lot of sense. But in the long term, it makes it difficult to, to see the challenges that you're going to have and, and get ahead of them. It's such a good point. It, essentially, if I'm reading you correctly, what you're saying is that the challenge that we see as such a huge problem of, of diversity in this country and in this continent the fact that it's uh, it's you know that we we have all these different languages and cultures and creeds and you know the the, the the different nationalities and so on all compressed within this this area in this environment it, it it makes things quite difficult and what you're saying is if you if you push through and show the tenacity to get through and build a team that's that's diverse, first of all, in order to represent that that uh, environment, but also to meet the challenges and to effectively communicate and recognize the, uh, the, the market. That's actually an opportunity, more than anything else. That's right. I, th I think that what you'll end up with is you have to pick a place to start. And, and, that, and then where you start has to be large enough for, your, for a solid footing. But in order to go the distance, you're going to have to meet those customers on their terms, not force them to come onto yours. Mm -hmm. And so that means that you're either going to have a constellation of products and services out there that meet these various groups, mm -hmm. or as you're building, you will build a sufficiently diverse enough team that actually they'll inform you sure. what it is you need to build to sure. reach them. Gotcha. And it'll be one of those two, 10 years, 15 years from now, when we're looking back at some of the winners in Africa what we'll see is that the either consolidated different specific products to, that, that capture different markets, mm -hmm. or you'll see a team that actually cleverly and, and, and thoroughly worked to serve each of the distinct customers that they had, okay. and, 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 and that it reflected that organization that they built, too. Gotcha. That's such a good point. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. And last question from me. You, uh, you've, moved, you've left Flipkart and you're now in charge of a 
relatively tidy sum of 120 billion dollars <laughs> uh, for the uh, for the, the University of California. That's, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So, um, how do our uh, our viewers come and uh, punch you for some of that that money? Some the, of that loot? The, you can come, but it's going to be like drinking from a fire hose. We, we, our check sizes are much larger than the hundred grand that uh, you'd need for a small business, but you know. <laughs> okay, well that's, that sounds like a, a challenge that we'll, we'll, try and, uh, we'll try and take you up on. But Absolutely. Nikit, thanks so much for, uh, for visiting our shores. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for, for being me. here. And, yeah. uh, and what an honor to, to have you on the Heavy Chef stage later this evening. Pleasure to be here.